meeting in our webinar. Thank you for recording to David. I have seen also Niels is there and welcome Maya Vachina, the first speaker. Welcome everybody to our webinar, WIFM and EFSOM webinar. It's a collaboration. It's especially for students, but also for young doctors who want to learn a little bit more of different topics in ultrasound. Today, our, I think Alita, Alina Popescu, I, she is chairing with me the program of this webinar. She is not there. I, we should excuse her because she is too busy in that moment. That's why I will give the introduction and the welcome to you all. And we, the first speaker about our topic is today Maya Racina. And please give a short uh, information about where you are working and what you are doing. And our program is we start with the first lecture, then we will hear something about a paper. And in the second part, we have a second lecture that will be given by Vito Kanzitani from the EFSOM board. Please to everyone and the technical basic is that you please close your microphone. And Niels and David, they look that all microphones are closed, then it's, we have no problems with the presentation. During the presentation, everyone should uh, close the screen. Only when we go in discussion after the presentation, then please open your screen that we can see you. And please notice your questions during the presentation in the chat. Put your questions in the chat. And then we together with the speaker, with Maya at first, we can give answers to your questions all. Okay, everything is clear for you. Welcome everybody. We are in the moment, we are 36 participants. I hope there will be some more. I have seen also Adnan, welcome to you and uh, some others. We can start, Maya, are you ready? Yes, hello everyone. Okay. And greetings from uh, sunny Riga that is located in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, I speak to you from Latvia, a bit along uh, the Baltic Sea coast. And uh, let me share today with you uh, the introductory lecture of today's topic of uh, thyroid gland. And uh, I hope you can see uh, my screen. Perfect. Is that right? Perfect. Yeah. So today I will uh, give an insight into the basics of uh, ultrasound examination. Also, we will uh, touch the certain aspects of anatomy and uh, there will be an introduction in pathology. I also will go through the basic methodology of how is the examination performed by mentioning all the methods, but my colleague Vito Cantisani will continue in his talk more in the details about those advanced methods. So let me start. Uh, with the introduction that I have been in uh, European Federation of Ultrasound in Medicine and Biology in a short EPSOM uh, quite a time and I uh, have served as a president of Latvian Ultrasound Society for some time and I have been actively involved in EPSOM also education committee uh, and I was chairing it uh, in the last term and it was a great honor for me uh, to become a member of a very friendly EFSOM family. Mm. And subsequently, uh, with the joint activities, I have been involved also in the World Federation Ultrasound Society educational mm. activities, thanks to uh, great collaborations with uh, colleagues from all over the world. So I hope you will enjoy today's meeting. Normal anatomy. Mm. The thyroid gland, as we know, resembles a butterfly shape, and it is an endocrine organ located in the front of the neck. A bit wrapping 
around the trachea. And uh, we know that it is composed of the two lobes. And in the mid of those lobes, there is a, like a bridge called isthmus. And sometimes there is an extension uh, a bit cranially that is called pyramidal lobe. It is quite small, although has a great role in our body by regulating the mm -hmm. metabolism, uh, regulating also in uh, uh, quite extensive uh, function situation, the heart rate and uh, the responses uh, to the uh, all environmental irritations that we have. So with a hyperfunction, um, we are uh, acting as if we were in um, adrenaline rush. So the heart rate goes up, there's a sweating. And on the opposite, when there is a hypofunction, we become more um, depressed and more sleepy. The metabolism um, reduces and there is a gain of the weight. What are the benefits of thyroid ultrasound? Uh, the first of all, uh, it is, of course, the method of the choice for the examination of this organ because it's quite small and uh, the ultrasound provides the high resolution for this superficial and relatively small structure. Plus, it shows an ability uh, to be available in a quite wide areas all over the globe. Plus, it is convenient for the patient at, it does not have any invasive aspect and does not use any ionizing radiation. And in an extremely important point to emphasize is that it is a real-time examination. Therefore, if the patient is moving, if there are breathing moments, and if they are swallowing disorders adjacent to this, we can also review those aspects as well in a real time that is not provided by any other cross-sectional imaging. Thyroid gland usually is examined by the ultrasound linear probe, which nowadays requires quite high frequency and um, depending on the size of the neck and also the location of this thyroid gland, we probably uh, also would work with a mid range of the frequencies like 12 or 14, but sometimes it would be very beneficial to reach up to 18 megahertz for adequate delineation of the superficial parts and also to reach the good penetration into the depth. The average examination depth is four to five centimeters. We are scanning usually in two planes, in a transverse view, as you can see in this image, and we use the perpendicular plane called longitudinal plane, although the longitudinal axis is usually adjusted along the longest axis of the thyroid lobe, therefore a bit oblique along the trachea. Both classic basic methods as the B mode or 2D imaging mode is used for the assessment of the anatomy, the surrounding structures, and to evaluate the further aspects, we use uh, additional modalities, including color Doppler mode to assess the overall vascularization and to characterize the nodules, and also the additional and uh, more advanced, more novel methods such as ultrasound elastography and its subtypes and contrast enhancement, which requires the injection of the contrast media into the bloodstream in a peripheral venous axis. What is required, these are the programs, the ability of the technology to provide us these um, tools. Therefore, this can probably not be performed by any ultrasound equipment, but the more sophisticated and high-end machines with a specific program software that is dedicated for elastography and contrast enhancement will give that opportunity. Patient usually is in a supine position and to expose this neck part, we usually ask for the patient to hyperextend the head a bit with the chin lifted up. Thyroid gland ultrasound indications are usually for the characteristic of the thyroid gland itself to assess is the structure homogeneous or are there any structural changes? 
To assess the size, as we know that the goiter may be diffuse and also be of the nodular type, we have to address the size according to the underlying pathology. Also, we look at the margins. Are they smooth? Are they bulging, suggesting of the enlargement of the lobes? And we assess the vascularity. So let me show you in a video the example, how does the transverse view of the thyroid gland looks like? In the central part, we see the trachea and pay attention, usually we don't scan only at the midline. We try to move a bit on the side of the trachea, not to make an unpleasant compression to the airways. If we suspect any thyroid nodules, we start to differentiate their type. Are they probably benign or they have any suspicious signs for malignancy, which is very important and actually is the main aim of the ultrasound examination. Then there are several diseases which are part of the diffuse parenchymal changes that affects the whole thyroid gland and we may see the changes evolving during the time, like for example, thyroiditis. The differentiation of the thyroid lesions sometimes is challenging because there are other structures that are adjacent to the thyroid gland, like lymph nodes, like uh, neck, congenital or branchial cleft cysts. There are also other tumors that could arise from salivary gland or other soft tissue in the neck. And they are adjacent normal parathyroid glands that may resemble the thyroid nodules. First characteristics that we perform on the B mode is to find the typical localization and to address, especially the lower margin that may sometimes extend into retrosternal and to the upper mediastinum part that probably would require some further imaging to assess the possible uh, compression of the trachea or other organs. Also, we assess the size and we do the measurements. As you can see in this example, the measurements are in a cross type in a perpendicular two planes on the axial scan, but we also uh, measure the third uh, dimension to assess the volume. Then, as I told you, we uh, examine uh, the margins. Are they smooth? Like in this case, yes, they are a bit uh, maybe irregular in a certain way, maybe lobulated appearance, but the contour is absolutely clearly depictable. Then we assess the echogenicity and usually the thyroid gland is brighter than the surrounding neck muscles like this sternocleidomastoid muscle. And uh, also they are usually appearing as a homogeneous tissue if they are healthy. And my mentioned vascularization. Here you can see the assessment of the third dimension of the craniocaudal or longitudinal dimension, which is used for calculation of the volumes. The volumes are slightly uh, lower in the women and a bit larger in the men. And we also measure the isthmus part separately from the both lobes. Looking at the topography, we see that this part of the neck is quite busy. Although the thyroid gland is located quite superficially and is easily accessible, we see that there are a lot of adjacent structures that may also uh, be involved and may obscure sometimes our visibility. What we can see is that there is a trachea, therefore some parts of the thyroid gland, if they will go behind the tracheal part will be obstructed by the artifacts from the air inside the trachea. Therefore, we need to work precisely with our hand by tilting and sliding the probe to assess those quite closed areas of the visibility and to assess them. 
Also, if the thyroid gland extends into the retrosternal part, we sometimes may move from the superficial way of looking at this structure by the use of unconventional way using the convex probe to assess the full depths. So we kind of take the abdominal ultrasound probe to reach the deeper uh, points of this nodular or maybe extension of the thyroid goiter. So also dorsally, especially to the left lobe, but depending on the uh, position of the head, the esophagus may be located behind the trachea or maybe even move to the right side behind the thyroid lobe. So we must remember that this is not a nodule, but there is another structure. Not to miss this aspect, it's very important that we always look at any structure that we have found in the two planes to make sure that it is more like a nodule type, not the extension, like in an esophagus case, that would be elongated structure and would not be as a nodule in a, a multiple planes. Also adjacent, we see that the major uh, neck vessels are located like carotid artery and jugular vein. And sometimes there are uh, side diagnoses found like atherosclerosis, or maybe some changes in the vessels like thrombosis that probably could be important in the diagnosis. When we talk about the color Doppler, this is quite debatable aspect in thyroid ultrasound. Why? It used to be a very important tool until the recent years where the vascularization of the nodules have reduced its role in characterization of the nodules being benign or malignant because these nodules are usually quite well vascularized structures and either they are mixed vascularization or quite a marked vascularization. We have developed a technology that is so sensitive that sometimes these patterns overlap into the benign and malignant nodules. And therefore, further studies of the quite detailed measurements of the spectral Dopplerography and to evaluate the peak systolic velocities are not as popular as they were some time ago. But what is clear that in case of the pathologies, these systolic volumes are rising and also the resistivity indexes into the supplying arteries like thyroid artery superior and inferior poles are rising. So as you can see in this case, so we see that uh, there is a, a quite high volumes of 41 centimeters per second in, in this uh, vascularization. So here you can see the patterns of the benign, predominantly cystic nodule with quite mixed and extensive vascularization by being benign. This is more solid nodule with more peripheral uh, vascularization type. And sometimes these vessels that we see surrounding the nodule make a halo sign pattern. So they are resembling like a darker rim around the nodule and defining its margins. In this case, this is a malignant nodule. Also, you can see it's quite uh, vascularized and there are some overlapping of these signs. Talking about the elastography, it is a dynamic examination that is uh, with the aim to assess the stiffness, but not the stiffness of the whole uh, thyroid gland, but the specific nodule. So we are performing either the compression of the tissue or we are sending inside the tissue the push pulse that is giving a share waves, which also could be measured. So we measured the propagation of these waves. The benign nodules are assumed usually to be soft and easy to deform, while malignant nodules are usually harder in their structure and more difficult to deform. Strain elastography is more relying to the compression and you can see in a B mode, here is the quite calcified, irregular um, bordered uh, nodule. 
and we do the measurements in comparison to the adjacent thyroid tissue. So we do the measurement inside the nodule and we do the measurement in the normal, relatively normal tissue and we measure the ratio. In this case, the ratio is very high. So the nodule is eight times stiffer than the surrounding and adjacent parenchyma, suggestive of the malignancy. And also there is a color coding of these features. And depending on the Bender machine, uh, the hardest uh, structures may appear red or blue. Share wave elastography also gives the colorful map quite um, similar way, but we also see the possibility to assess the propagation of those share waves. Plus it gives us the quantitative measurement of specific um, pattern of uh, the stiffness uh, that is uh, depending on those propagation speeds and uh, later is calculated into the kilopascals. Those kilopascals kilo are giving us an understanding with the threshold values. Are these more likely to be benign findings or more likely to be malignant if exceeding 37.5 kilopascals? When we talk about the um, case, how it should be done and how it can be done in uh, routine praxis, whenever we find on a B mode and on the color Doppler mode, by the signs, any suspicious finding, we can adjust additionally to the elastography assessment. It is not a compulsory, but it is like a one extra element, although it is not yet included into the standardized evaluation uh, categories of the tyrants. We see the irregular margin of the nodule. It's quite iso, slightly hypo, echogenic to the adjacent structures. It's uh, markedly vascularized, but more into the periphery. And here we see that the, from the previous slide, the shear wave measurements, and we also perform the measurement of the strain elastography. Strain elastography shows the ratio in between the nodule and the adjacent uh, tissue exceeding two. Also the absolute measurements of the shear wave um, kilopascals is quite high, suggestive of the malignancy. Therefore, it is one more suggestive aspect to send this nodule for the further biopsy. Contrast enhanced ultrasound is one of the methods that could also be an additional tool for the assessment of the thyroid nodule characterization, are they malignant or the benign? Let me show you the video of how it is in the real time. So we inject the contrast media into the peripheral vein and starting from the few seconds after injection, we gradually see the enhancement into this target, our nodule. We see that uh, this enhancement is happening quite rapidly. Therefore, we always try to store the video clips for the possibility to review the image by image on the later time points. So here we see also the non-homogeneous enhancement. There is one part that is uh, more hypovascular, but in general, it enhances quite homogeneously. It's well marginated, and this was a benign nodule. And this was examination performed prior to the radiofrequency ablation of this nodule, which is very important aspect of uh, thyroid ultrasound, minimally invasive treatment opportunities in ultrasound guidance. Let me go through a few pathologies. Uh, let's start with the development abnormalities, which are quite rare, but still are um, quite uh, visible and easily uh, defined by the ultrasound. So sometimes we have an ectopic uh, type of thyroid tissue. Sometimes part of the thyroid gland is not developed. Then we have a hypoplasia or aplasia of some parts. And sometimes we have a remnant of the ductus stereoglossus and there is a bulging lesion into the front of the neck appearing as a tereoglossal cyst, which appears uh, hypoechoic depending on the content, sometimes could also uh, contain anechoic fluid. 
And here you can see the example, how does the lobe hypoplasia may look like? So the one side is appearing larger than the other side. And if there is no history of any surgery performed, we can uh, define its congenital variation. Let me show you a few examples of the diffuse diseases of the thyroid gland. One of them is autoimmune thyroid disease, which presents with stereotoxicosis. And usually there is a bulging appearance of the neck soft tissues. Uh, the thyroid gland is enlarged. It is very well vascularized and uh, not containing too many nodules, which uh, differentiates it from the nodular goiter. So we see that quite bulging enlargement of the both lobes, sometimes a bit asymmetric. And we see that marked hypervascularization diffusely within the thyroid gland. Of course, depending on the therapy, we may see the follow-up changes into the structure and also the intensity of the vascularization. Another diffuse disease that is quite common in a regular routine scanning of the thyroid gland, it is the inflammation that is also an autoimmune induced, but there is more a lymphocytic infiltration inside the thyroid gland. Also uh, causing the diffuse enlargement with heterogeneous structure, but in these cases, thyroid gland has more patchy, uh, more non-regular hypoechoic darker areas as an inclusions inside the both lobes. Sometimes there also may be a nodule form formation, like a substitution for this impaired function, because this thyroiditis represents with a gradual in a several decades, almost uh, the lifetime journey for the patient with a reduction of the function. So the patients with a chronic autoimmune thyroiditis usually reach the hypotheriosis at the end stages of the disease. Because of the chronic inflammation, there is more also fibrotic tissue appearing with each decade and therefore the normal thyroid tissue are replaced by the scars. And this is an active enlargement this is uh, still uh, quite ongoing, chronic autoimmune thyroiditis. And there is a pathognomic sign of the hypervascularity throughout the whole thyroid gland that is called inferno. Later in the stages, we see that there are some nodular formations, calcifications, the border becomes very ir irregular. But overall, finding of the thyroid gland is quite hypoechoic, almost resembling the echogenicity of the adjacent muscles. And in the late stages, as I mentioned, there is a size reduction due to the fibrosis and also the reduction of the function. This is more tricky type of the thyroiditis because it is uh, without a clear uh, onset, it can be reactive after some viral infection or some other uh, triggering factors. And it appears as the more poorly defined regions where we have a hypoechoic areas with decreased vascularity. And usually the thyroid gland stays normal unless that this located regional thyroiditis, subacute thyroiditis, is affecting maybe a whole lobe. Usually patients present with uh, quite uh, changing symptoms of uh, even the pain in the neck. There may be some feverish feeling and it changes very rapidly. On some days, patient feels very active. On some days, patient feels very uh, depressed. So there is a high sinusoid of the hormonal also secretion in such a thyroid gland. So we see the asymmetry 
On the one side, there is a normal echogenicity, quite small lobe. On the other side, the lobe is hypoechoic and asymmetrically enlarged. And this is the ultrasound scan of that patient after the therapy of the three months, we see that the thyroid has been normalized. But in those areas of the active thyroiditis, we see this darker hypoechoic irregular areas, as we can also see in this case. So we have to keep in the mind that this is not just a mental feeling of the pain and maybe some swelling and hyperemia on the skin in those patients. The majority of the examination is dedicated to the nodules. Actually, depending on the literature, up to 70% of the adult population has one or many nodules in their thyroid gland. And only part of them, also depending on the cohorts, seven up to 10, and sometimes 15% of the thyroid nodules may be malignant. Therefore, the ultrasound is playing a very important role in finding those possible malignant ones. Usually the benign nodules are smoothly marginated, maybe mixed more solid or maybe more cystic appearance. They have a possibility to contain the colloid inclusions or maybe can also be just the cysts. All of these quite various patterns are still benign nodules. And when they become too many, they also cause the enlargement of the thyroid gland, which is called nodular goiter, where there is no area of the normal gland. Everything is in the nodules. Like in this case, we can continue to scan and sometimes those large nodules do not even fit into our field of the view. In those cases, we use the trapezoid mode or wide view mode to enhance the visibility on those distant parts. Where is the role of ultrasound in all the workup of the thyroid nodules? When we palpate something in the neck, or there is a suspicious because of the hyper or hypofunction by the laboratory tests, we can look at the sonography and we can draw the pattern and raise the suspicion for the possible malignancy. If it looks clearly as a benign, no further workup is required. But if there is any grade of suspicion raised, Depending on the size, there is a recommendation to perform a cytology a diagnostic approach, which is done by ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration biopsy in a short FNAB. Later by the cytology classification, they are classified into the six categories by the Bethesda system and uh, results may uh, come back as a benign, there can be uh, a different type of uh, dysplastic changes and uh, higher suspicion or clear malignant findings. Although, depending on the precision of the performer, sometimes we get a non-diagnostic results. Depending on institution, it could be 5, 10, or even up to 20% of the results. Depending on the different patterns, there is also the probability of the malignancy. So typical cysts, of course, are usually benign, although we can never say that there is 100% in a medicine, therefore less than 1% we leave um, for the possibility of the malignancy. More mixed, but predominantly cystic nodules have a very low risk of malignancy more solid structures and with a heterogeneous uh, content has a low suspicion. And the more darker these solid components become more hypoechogenic, the higher the suspicion raises up to 20%. And if there are some 
heterogeneity, the quite chaotic inclusions, some calcifications, and if the contour changes and if the shape changes, the suspicious are the suspicions are rising. These are the recommendations for fine needle aspiration biopsy. So whenever we see low suspicion nodules, then we can wait until they grow up to two centimeters to perform the fine needle aspiration biopsy. But those who contain the more suspicious patterns are requiring the biopsy in much smaller size. These are uh, one of the examples of the thyroid systems. This is the American uh, system that uh, addresses the several aspects, what we have to think about when we perform ultrasound, about the composition, echogenicity, shape, margin, inclusions, those foci inside the nodule, and giving the points to the each of those patterns. Depending on the combination of the points, there is a probability and the suspicious for the malignancy. How does the composition look like? So the echogenicity, already I mentioned, either they are more cystic, mixed cystic, multi-cystic, or more solid component or sponge type. These are all the characteristics that gives a certain point in our understanding of the malignancy risks. Then we describe the echogenicity. If it's anechoic, it's a cyst but there could be nodules which are brighter, hyperechoic. They can be almost as the same echogenicity, isoechoic as the thyroid gland. They can be quite marked hypoechoic. And whenever they become so dark, they are always rising a suspicion. Thyroid nodule also may change their shape more increasing into the taller shape resembling the growth into the easiest axis, which could be related to the possibility of the malignancy. So taller than wide is considered as a suspicious pattern. Then we look at the margins. Are they clear, smooth, or there are situations where margins are not well visible. They are irregular. Sometimes it's very hard to even see the border, but we clearly see that this nodule is growing outside of the thyroid gland and is bulging out of it. So extra thyroidal extension. Also these echogenic foci, the most benign ones are the colloid inclusions, especially into cystic parts, which can show the comet tail artifacts, but there are macro calcifications that could appear as a more benign finding, but when there are micro, small foci of calcifications, this is very suspicious finding for the papillary cancer. Sometimes nodules show the egg shape calcifications. This is another uh, thyroid system from the Europe, EU thyroids, that is also the mentioning typical malignant patterns as irregular shape, microcalcifications and market hypoechogenicity. In Latvia, we use our own thyroid system and we do not give the points. We categorize as the more benign findings, majority of the nodules, and we also include into the benign category, the moderately hypoechogenic structures. But whenever there are these signs of malignancy, of irregular contour, microcalcifications, and all the previously mentioned patterns, the more signs are there, one, two, three, or four, the higher is suspicious and the possibility of the malignancy. The report, according to the European recommendation, should contain the volume the characterization of echogenicity, vascularity, all the nodules, where they are located, what is the size, shape, and then those thyroid scores. 
then if there is any change from the previous examinations, where do the changes extend? Is there any additional findings like regional lymph node changes? And then there is a conclusion which also contains the management recommendation, for example, the further recommendation to perform the biopsy. The biopsy recommendations uh, globally uh, are a bit different, but the ones that are most commonly used are the uh, generated in uh, ATA guidelines in 2015, uh, talking about those nodules that are less than one centimeter, we usually do not perform the biopsy unless it is very suspicious or there is a family history or this is the um, pediatric patient or other highly uh, suspicious aspects. And if there are good findings and there is a low probability of malignancy, we may even wait until they grow until two centimeters. Fine needle aspiration biopsy, oh, depending on those Bethesda categories, also may uh, have a certain malignancy risks. And we know that also nothing is 100%. And also it is Bethesda category six malignancy rate reaches only by to 99%. So here you see the video on how the biopsies can be performed. So there are different ways how to aspirate, but usually there is a bit of a rotation or a bit of a stabbing of our nodule to get the cells inside the needle tip, like in this case shown. It is always performed in ultrasound guidance. Either the fine needle aspiration biopsy and in a more suspicious cases, sometimes even core biopsy. Why it is all performed? Because of the thyroid cancer. These are the most common ones. The majority of the cases are papillary thyroid carcinomas, which reach 80% of the cases, but shows a very good survival rate if found in the initial stages. More tricky is the fo follicular thyroid carcinoma uh, and uh, the incidence is much rarer and also a good survival rate. And uh, I will also show you a few examples of those uh, cancers uh, in the uh, incoming slides. So papillary carcinoma usually are representing quite palpable, stiff, hard nodules because they contain usually some calcified aspects. Either they are larger or just micro calcifications and when they are below one centimeter, we even call them microcarcinoma. Unfortunately, quite early, they give a metastasis in a central and also jugular lymph nodes in a quite extensive way, which uh, does not uh, give a good start for the patient in their workup. And sometimes there is a necessity, especially to perform for these nodules, the radioactive iodine therapy afterwards, not only the surgery. The most unfortunate cases and rare cases is a diffuse sclerosing papillary carcinoma where all the parenchyma is involved into the cancer resembling the snowstorm pattern. And these cases are not presenting with any symptoms. There is no palpable one nodule, but they quite early give a metastatic changes into the lymph nodes and the lymph nodes also contain the calcifications, which is pathognomic sign of papillary carcinoma. Follicular carcinoma may resemble quite homogeneous, like a benign nodule. And also on a cytology, it's almost impossible to differentiate them from the benign adenomas, therefore requiring a different workup. Unfortunately, they also give a distant hematogenous metastasis, therefore uh, giving a metastasis more distant and uh, therefore giving a challenge on uh, maybe presenting as the first finding these metastatic lesions until we reach that the primary is thyroid. This is a very uh, uh, bad type of the thyroid cancer, it's anaplastic cancer, 
Luckily, it uh, gives only one to two percent from thyroid malignancy cases, but it usually grows extremely rapidly in a few months, providing a quite extensive neck structure compression syndrome and uh, very quickly invades the vessels and uh, gives the metastasis in uh, a lot of organs, including lungs, uh, liver, and the brain. Unfortunately, mortality is very high and uh, gives uh, half of the all mortality from the thyroid uh, cancer mortality rates. So here we see the heterogeneous, large, irregularly contoured, chaotic mass sometimes may even uh, have a destructive component. Medullary carcinoma is also a rare type of um, thyroid malignancy. It has a um, uh, connection to the hereditary disease associated with a multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type two. And uh, actually could give a good survival rate if detected early. And usually this requires the endocrinology workup for the whole family to um, follow up even the family members, uh, if they don't have any findings or if they have the findings to perform the operations in a very small uh, microcarcinomas to save these uh, lives. What is uh, typical for medullary carcinoma, they secrete quite extensively calcitonin and in cases if it exceeds 100 picograms per milliliter, you can tell for 100% uh, that this is a case of medullary carcinoma. They can be a bit irregular, uh, usually hypoechoic, may contain the calcifications. There is no typical one pathognomic sign for this type of the carcinoma. Also one of the rare carcinomas is a lymphoma. It can uh, also grow quite rapidly. Uh, presenting with compression syndrome, could be also uh, with a, uh, some fever, weight loss, and show the marked hypoechogenicity and usually are hypovascular as uh, majority of the lymphomas, and also they are adjacent lymph nodes. Very briefly, just one slide about the lymph node involvement. I already mentioned in papillary carcinoma, we will find the microcalcifications. These are called specific lymph nodes. Sometimes there are um, millions of non-specific lymph nodes in all groups of the neck soft tissue, but you can see that the ultrasound features for the malignant invo involvement is if the lymph nodes contain those calcifications, some cysts, are more periphery vascularized than the central hyalur vessel and they are more rounded. These are the benign lymph nodes with a lipomatose hyalum, nice parenchyma. Although they appear dark, they are benign, elongated, and usually have a central vessel. These are normal lymph nodes. And just one last slide, that there are other lesions adjacent to the thyroid gland called parathyroid glands. Usually we don't see the normal parathyroid glands, although the better the machines are, the better we actually are starting to see even a small normal glands. Usually there are four located along the posterior contour of the thyroid gland or behind the thyroid or in between the thyroid gland and the trachea or esophagus. When there are changes like hyperplasia or adenoma, they cause the elevated parathormone levels and calcium levels in the bloodstream, presenting with the complications of it like kidney stones and uh, some other aspects. And usually these are secondary changes to the chronic kidney disease, could be also related to the D vitamin deficiency and other aspects. More challenging are atypical locations, but whenever we see some dark lesion at the poles of the thyroid gland or next to the border or at the posterior aspect, we should think about the possibility of the parathyroid gland lesion. And with this, I want to conclude my talk and I will be happy to answer any questions if they will arise. 
Thank you very much. Maya, please stop your presentation. Okay, open your windows, please. Everyone, are there some questions? We look in the chat, there's nothing in the chat. Please open your the screens. Are there some questions? My question would be, I think the number you told that the number of malignant lesions are seven to 15% that is uh, in one study. That is really a high number. It, uh, are there differences, regional differences in Europe or Asia or others? Do we know something about that? I think yes. I think there are differences, but not yet is defined that uh, absolutely in a certain uh, uh, community will be higher rates. But overall, we know that uh, the thyroid uh, changes uh, may be related to the radiation risks. So there has been uh, also uh, talking about the Chernobyl um, time in uh, Europe it was estimated that there are higher thyroid malignancy rates due to this uh, radioactive <laughs> iodine exposure, but uh, not necessary. Uh, I think it is a combination of a genetics, but also nowadays the, the global community is so mixed that we cannot rely on only the race or predominance. So there are uh, populations where five, percent only of malignancy rate. Thank you. I think the uh, the elastography is not the common used everywhere. You have, I think only a few of the specialists in in that time they have uh, the elastography at the additional tool in that situation. I think in the future it will uh, play a bigger role, but in the moment, I think we need more other the other tools. And the basic overall is every time uh, the B mode. Do you agree? Yes. yes. Uh, there was a great uh, expectations for elastography, so we were assuming that this color coding will give us an answer easy. Yeah. So benign or malignant. But as always uh, in medicine, it's more complicated and there are a lot of overlapping symptoms. And I want to stress out, this probably will be in a subsequent talk, that unfortunately these tricky follicular carcinomas may appear as soft, uh, soft nodules, therefore totally mixing up the understanding and not giving any benefit in elastography. Talking about the question, I also saw in the chat. There is one question about the rim that is, please look in there, that is, what is the malignancy potential of rim calcific, calcified thyroid nodules? It is uh, estimated that actually those calcifications are um, represented in a higher malignancy risk populations. But when we talk about the macro calcifications, the average risk is about 30 to 35%, while those rim calcifications like eggshell calcifications are showing higher malignancy potential if this rim is ruptured. Yeah, But in general, it is two times less than in macro calcification groups, so probably some 15 to 70%. Okay, there's the last question. It is it possible to differentiate malignant uh, nodule from con consolidated nodule post-enabled or spontaneous collapse? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I probably understand that this was the nodule that uh, was probably with the largest cysting uh, component mm -hmm. and then it shrink. Yeah, and now it appears as a dark nodule. Yes. It is a great challenge and therefore it's very important if you have any history or especially the prior images to compare something. Yeah. So if you understand the same applies for those appearance of the hemorrhages of the cystic uh, components, which suddenly shows the enlargement of the nodule. This is also a tricky cases where you should have a certain workup. 
for 100%, you cannot um, define only by ultrasound saying that this is a, for sure not malignant, yeah? But if you have a previous and you have the context of the case, then you have a high probability to say it right. And just a minor remark, we will deal more and more with radio frequency ablated nodules. And unfortunately, some of them, when they shrink, they also look very dark. So it's very important that we know the prior history of this patient. There's a question or a comment of our friend Adnan uh, from Greece, <laughs> from Turkey. As far as I know, inferno pattern is a feature of Grace, which mentioned as a feature of Hashimoto. For me, in my experience, it's also the first feature of uh, of Grace. Of uh, yes. I think the, what, what I wanted to show with that is not that infermo <laughs> is pathognomic for uh, Hashimoto thyroiditis. I just wanted to show that how does this inferno look like? And sometimes okay. they overlap and the very active Hashimoto thyroiditis may also be very glowing, very mm -hmm. extensive. Mm -hmm. And it is not a sign for the specific disease. It is a name for this blooming for this uh, thyroid on fire, I would call, yeah? I, I think we can say where is a lot of color, there's a lot of function. Is it true? Can we say that every yeah. time or overall we can say a lot of color, then it's uh, no malignancy, then we have more function there. And we need, on the other side, we need also the in vitro diagnostic to say something about the, the thyroid disease. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation, Maya. And we come back to some of the topics. Uh, you propose a paper. Have you also a speaker, a speaker who will present the paper you proposed? Yes. Oh, there is yeah, NM Popova. That is Nina Malika Popova. Thank you very much for coming and please share your presentation. Hello, do you see? Yes, we see. Yep, okay. It's fantastic, we see it. Yeah, so I'm also from Riga, Latvia, and I'm a uh, uh, second year radiology resident here in Paul Stradinch Clinical University Hospital and a big honor for me to be today a part of this webinar and I want to present to you our team study impact of the hypohygienicity criteria on thyroid nodule malignancy risk certification performance <coughs> by different thyroid systems. As you know, the thyroid nodules are very common in the general population and with an increase of imaging techniques, more thyroid nodules are accidentally detected. Only a small part of a nodule is malignant and their evaluation is a common clinical diagnostic challenge. Nowadays, the ultrasound is a primary diagnostic method for patients with uh, thyroid nodules and it's allowed to detect more than 70% of nodules comparing to classical palpation. And fine needle aspiration is a primary method for diagnosis thyroid cancer, but not all nodules need to be biopsied. So most of the thyroid nodules are benign and asymptomatic about 85 to 30, uh, 93%. However, in five to 15% of the cases, the nodules are malignant. Uh, in the past decade, several Professional societies and uh, research groups have implemented guidelines to provide a standardized assessment uh, of ultrasonographic features of thyroid nodules to assess the need of the fine needle aspiration biopsy or FNA. Initially in 2009, Hover TAL introduced a thyroid malignancy risk certification uh, system, thyroid, inspired by. Uh, breast imaging reporting data system. And the aim of it is uh, to stratify malignancy risk uh, based on ultrasound signs, to standardize and simplify reporting uh, by ensuring effective multidisciplinary communication and to improve the quality and cost of uh, care by reducing unnecessary uh, biopsies. So, 
uh, based on a combination of serial ultrasound uh, features, serial tired nodule imaging reporting and data system have been developed worldwide, uh, such as European, uh, Korean, uh, American uh, Tired Association, also American College of Radiology, and also uh, including a slightly modified version of tired development but, uh, system in Korea or QAKL system that is used in Latvia now. And the sensitivity of the system is high, but the different certification criteria maintain accuracy and specificity at the suboptimal level. So uh, in the period of 2019 to 2021, a prospective multi-center study involving serial Latvian certified radiologist was uh, conducted to compare serial tired system, uh, that system, uh, tired system that is used in Latvia or modified quack AL version, uh, European system, Korean, and also American College of Radiology tired system to assess the impact of hypoechogenicity as a malignancy risk on overall diagnosis accuracy assessment. And to define the difference more clearly between the systems, I will visually illustrate all the systems that are included in this uh, study. So according to the European tired system or EO tired, tired nodules were classified as tired two if it's a simple cyst or a sponge form nodule, uh, tire three, it's, if it is a smooth, uh, isohogenic, ovoid, uh, solid nodule without high suspicious features, isohogenic or hypohogenic nodule, yeah. Uh, tire four, if it's solid, mildly hypohogenic nodule without high suspicious features, and tired nodules were classified as tired five, if it's at least one of the following features like uh, a market hypohogenicity, micro calcifications, irregular margin, or non oval round shape, and uh, with the presence of a solid component. Going to Korean tired system or K tireds, in accordance, uh, tired nodules are classified as. Uh, uh, K2, uh, if, if it is a pure cyst, partly cystic uh, nodule with comet tail artifacts or sponge form nodules, uh, partly cystic isohogenic or hypoehogenic nodules without any suspicious features are classified as tires 3. And if these nodules are with any suspicious features like microcalcifications, non parallel orientation, or speculated microlabor a lobulated margin that these nodules are classified as uh, tires four. And furthermore, uh, as tires four classifies tired nodules if these uh, if they are solid, hypoehogenic without any suspicious features. And as uh, tired five classified organic nodules old sound features like non, -non, -non parallel orientation, speculated microlobulated margin, and microcalcification in a solid nodule structure. Uh, American College of Radiology tired system is based on points throughout the following categories, composition, ergonicity, uh, shape, margin, and ergonic foci. Uh, and moderate uh, hypohygienicity give two points uh, to the nodule. And for example, moderately hypohygienic nodule with a mixed salt composition, it's only three points and it starts three. But if it's a hypohygienic nodule with solid or almost solid component, it starts four. And going to the next uh, system that is used in Latvia, it's a modified version, QAKL version. Um, it's based on the count of suspicious feature, as uh, said Professor Radzina, um, and the, with the, the market hypohygienicity, microcalcifications, taller than white shape, irregular or microlobulated speculated margin, and metastatic uh, lymph nodes. And that uh, three include the uh, partly cystic nodules, 
solid nodule with either echogenic or hyperechogenic and also moderately hyper uh, hypoechogenic structure without any independent uh, signs of malignancy and uh, if nodule uh, and nodule classified as 4a if there is a one sign of uh, malignancy 4b if there are two signs of malignancy 4c if there are three signs of malignancy and tires 5 if there are four and more signs of malignancy so going up to the study in total in the study there were 274 patients with 289 thyroid nodules underwent conventional ultrasound examination and nodules were classified according to uh, these four thyroid systems so european korean acr thyroid system and also latvian thyroid system for which uh, moderate hypoorganicity is not considered as a malignancy sign all patients with uh, clinical indications for fine needle aspirations were included in this study and samples were analyzed by certified histopathologists with experience in thyroid pathologies. And uh, thyroid nodule fine needle aspiration material were classified into Bethesda classification categor categories, uh, which uh, was uh, considered as a gold standard. So, in the study, there were 151 thyroid nodules were, that were uh, mildly hypoechogenic uh, compared to thyroid parenchyma, of which 88% were benign and 12% were malignant. A total of uh, 48 thyroid nodules that were markedly hypoechogenic compared to the neck muscles uh, of them, 66.6% were benign and 33.3% were malignant. And from 81 isoechogenic nodules, 97.5% uh, were benign, and only 2.5% uh, were malignant. And now uh, hyperechogenic nodules were benign. So analyzing echogenicity as a malignancy risk evaluation criteria, it seems that only 12% from uh, mildly hypoechogenic nodules were malignant, which means that this feature is non-specific by the cell. While among the market hypoechogenic nodules, 33.3% uh, uh, were malignant, which means that every one of the three markedly hypoechogenic nodules uh, are malignant. And this proves that this feature is uh, specific by itself for malignancy. So to uh, better understand the difference in classifications, I will show you some examples. And in this case, you can see solid uh, hypoechoic uh, irregular margin oval nodule. And according to Latvian thyroid system, it uh, corresponds to class 4A because it uh, have this one uh, malignancy sign, irregular contour, and while according to other thyroid system, it corresponds to thyroid 5 because uh, of the irregular margin. Yes, and in this turn, according, accordingly uh, to cytology, it's a benign nodule, fo uh, follicular nodule, but has the two class. Uh, in this case, you can see solid, moderately hypoorganic, non-homogene, smoothly contoured nodule with a micro and also macro calcification in its structure, and which is uh, wider than tall. And according to thyroid cell 4A system, it's uh, also 4A because of this micro calcification in the structure, while according to other thyroid system, is, it is a thyroid 5. And uh, in this case, it's also where, but as a two class nodule, uh, benign follicular nodule. Here you can see in the lower pole of the right lobe, uh, 10 to 12 to 12 millimeters, slightly hypoechogenic, smoothly contoured nodule with a small cystic areas. Uh, in the periphery, an individual echogenic foci in the mass, it's seen. And, uh, as you can see, European, Korean, and ACR thyroid system classifies this nodule as thyroid uh, 5. Uh, so, but uh, instead of Latvian thyroid system that uh, classified this nodule as 4A, 
not just because of the this one sign of malignancy or microcalcifications. And also in this uh, in this case, it was a Bethesda two uh, nodule. Uh, in this case, you can see solid uh, uh, nodule mildly hypohagenic non homogene in the lower third of the right uh, lobe dorsally and it's a ill defined contour up to 2.5 centimeters with microcalcification and it's uh, classified as 4b for tire l tired system and uh, tired 5 for other three system and it was Bethesda 2 class nodule Here you can see solid, uh, moderately hypohagenic, sharply contoured, irregular margin nodule with microcalcification in its structure uh, and uh, the taller than wide size because uh, uh, and because uh, the nodule is irregular shape with microcalcification in structure and taller than wide shape, it's classified as l tard 4 c and other system classified this uh, nodule as TARDS-5. And uh, cytologically, it was Bethesda-6 uh, or, or papillary carcinoma. Here you can see small nodule. And I want to remember that small nodules firstly appear as relatively hypohagenic. And for these sub-centimeters nodules, five, fine needle aspiration biopsy may be advised only if they have several signs of malignancy. In this case, a slightly hypohagenic ill-defined nodule is visualized. The nodule is periphery vascularized and only if these criteria are taken, then l tards or latin tards system corresponds it's to the class 4A, uh, 4B, I'm sorry, and as uh, tards 5 according to other systems. So it's very important uh, to evaluate the neck and the lymph nodes in the neck. And in this patient, several hypohagenic lymph nodes with multiple microcalcification and chains called Hillar hypertrophy are visualized in the group three of the right side of the neck. And cytologically, the nodules were malignant response to Bethesda 6, and it was papillary carcinoma. As you can see, most of the nodules in this uh, study were benign, uh, but there were also other categories of the nodules. 6.9% uh, were Bethesda 1, or the material was uninformative. In 5.88% of the cases, the nodules correspond to Bethesda 3, or atypia of undetermined significance, or follicular lesions of undetermined significance. Uh, but test the four were in four cases, and it was follicular neoplasm or suspicious of a follicular neoplasm. And in 10 cases or 3.4%, the answer was Bethesda five or suspicious of malignancy. And all 26 um, uh, malignant nodules uh, were Bethesda six, and it was a popular carcinoma, and all these nodules were surgically treated and proved to be a popular carcinoma. Uh, as you can see here, European, Korean, and ACR tire systems had a high sensitivity, 97.2%. However, l tire system showed higher specificity 72.7% and the better accuracy 73.3% than other systems. In the l tire system, which is the QAKL modified version, mild hypohygienicity is not included in the malignancy features. So mild hypohygienicity third nodule 
so which do not have any other malignant uh, features are stratified as thyroid nodules with low risk of malignancy or thyroid three category nodules, uh, which results in a higher specificity and di diagnostic accuracy, and therefore showed different performance in comparison to other system, a comprehensive uh, decrease in sensitivity to 80.6%. Uh, so here you can see rock curves analysis for these uh, thyroid systems and all thyroid systems showed similar area uh, under the rock curve, L thyroid area under uh, curve uh, value was 0.76, then goes the Korean thyroid system with the AUC value 0.71. And then ACR tires with AUC value 0.69. And uh, the last uh, European tire system with the AUC value 0.68. So comparison uh, between the Latvian tire system and European, Korean, and ACR tire systems uh, of the uh, 208 uh, thyroid nodules classified as thyroid 4 and C in the European thyroid system, only 132 nodules were classified as 4 and 5th class nodules in the Latin thyroid system, and means uh, that 37% uh, of the nodules were classified as a lower class. In turn, uh, the Korean thyroid system divided 186 uh, nodules in the 4th and 5th class, uh, categories and here also there's a difference between Latvian and Korean tire system where Latvian tire system reduced need of FNA uh, for 30 percent. Uh, in total ACR tire system uh, classified the uh, nodules as tires 4 and 5 uh, for 211 uh, nodules while in the Latin tire system, there were 132 nodules, which corresponds to the fourth and the fifth class, which is for 38% uh, lesser. And this shows that L tire uh, system increased its specificity by uh, classifying nodules according to the numbers of malignancy, uh, reducing the frequency of unnecessary FNA stress and also financial cost for the patient. In comparison, uh, the risk of malignancy in the Latvian, Korean, European, and ACR tired system classes, L tires showed a lower risk of malignancy in, in tired three and a higher uh, risk of malignancy in tired five uh, compared to other tired systems. And it was 0.007%. And uh, for tired five, it was it was 0.58% respectively, indicating a higher diagnostic accuracy in patient selection for fine needle aspiration uh, biopsy. And uh, in the conclusion, this comparative study has shown that the uh, use uh, of different tired system can alter the number of of biopsies required by classifying mildly hypoergonic nodules as low risk nodules. European, uh, Korean, and ACR tired systems showed higher sensitivity compared to Latvian tired system, but the Latvian tired system uh, showed uh, was, was more specific and accurate. And the main model influencing the difference was the interpretation of hypoergonicity, giving precision to system that increased the risk of malignancies with pronounced uh, hypoergonicity at, at the same time with little sensitivity compensation. And thyroid, the first step in standardizing conclusion in interpretation by ensuring effective communication between radiologists, pathologists, surgeons, and also endocrinologists. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation and especially for the important paper. And it's a high rated paper. Thank you. Thank you. It was so a much. perfect presentation. Uh, is there a question?
Is there any question? If not, no problem. We have we are a little bit forward in our time, and that's why I like to. There is a question from Giovanni. Yes. Thank you for presentation. Why the nodules vascular pattern? Da, da, da. Please, can you read it? Uh, yeah. Why the nodules vascular pattern, especially in turn and as uh, well as peripheral, is not included in thyroid? In your opinion, should we consider also vascularization near thyroid in uh, order to put the indication to the FNA? Hmm. It's a good question because uh, I think none of the publications that I read, uh, I didn't see any information about vascularization. And it's uh, if it is a sign of uh, malignancy and, and the FNA an indication for FNA. So I really not sure that I can uh, uh, tell something about it. I, I don't know why it's not implemented there in that uh, in the tyrates, but I think we discussed already that hypervascularization, that means normally that uh, benign nodes yeah, that are out uh, autonome adenomas or others, and we don't think on an uh, malignant uh, about malignancy. I think it's very seldom that hypervascular tumor is uh, is malignant, and that's why uh, they exclude it. Thank you very much. Uh, we have to go on now, and I like to show you to show you now the presentation of our friend. Oh, we come to, okay, again. And let's go on. Is it is it running? Why not? Don't know. Now it's running. That is Vito Kanzitani. He is okay. Professor Nürnberg, um, you have to change the sound settings that your computer sound is uh, getting transferred through Zoom. We are okay, just we using your microphone. Okay, what I have to do, I have to change the presentation form. Uh, no, you have to go into uh, Freigeben and then there's a little. Box. Okay, I, I know, I know, I try it again. Okay. Uh, sorry. And we go here. That is the voice and video clip optimize. That's okay now. And now we start again. To who knowledge on basics in ultrasound of thyroids, and therefore my not my role will be easier right now. It would have been great to be together online, but uh, contemporary, unfortunately. I'm organizing my last Congress as Italian Ultrasound Society President in Matera. Wonderful day. And I invite you to visit Matera in the south of Italy. That is very unique. Let's move on, starting uh, on my presentation and starting by the epidemiology of tire nodules. The prevalence is ranging between 19 and 67 percent, mostly affecting female patients. But luckily, only 5 to 7% of those nodules are malignant ones. However, this is the most common endocrinological cancer. And it's so Nürnberg, did you open an, another program? We don't see anything. Okay. 
Und avoid over diagnosis and over treatment. What usually every day we do by means of color doppler ultrasound tyranodics. We detect tyranodics. We report how many they are. We describe dimensions. Then we describe ecostructures, discriminating solid, liquid, and mixture. Identify if there are micro and micro classification. Describe contours <laughs> and limits and the presence or the absence or the asymmetry of peripheral halo the appearance of taller than white or the presence of vascularization. Here, I summarize for all of you the most accurate ultrasound features, irregular or ill-defined borders, microclassification, hypercogenicity, absent or irregular or asymmetric halo, the taller than white appearance, still is questionable if number and dimension may be really important features that should be taken in consideration when we describe tire nodules. Here is the first example. Firstly, how to depict the nodule. The nodule has ecogenicity that can be different than tire nodule and also compared with the muscles. This case has irregular margins and has also some microclassification with it. This other nodule has hollow sign. He is a high soechoic to tired gland and has also an echoic area that is corresponding to fluid content. This oval shaped, mildly hyperechoic lesion because I compare with the tired muscles. And you can see that these have the same appearance. And this is typical for mild hypogogenicity. But if the nodule is markedly more hypoechoic than pretired muscles, therefore it is considered marked hypoechoic. Taller than Y, when there is an increasement on vertical size, and colloid when it's typically representing the comet tail artifact, as in this case. This is the diagnostic algorithm that we usually follow in these case, this cases. Firstly, patient's examination, lab analysis, ultrasound evaluation in order to describe suspicious features and dimension, and according to them, to submit patient to find needle aspiration. However, here is the representation of the number of indeterminate lesions at fine needle aspiration that is not really low and unfortunately provide an unnecessary surgical remotion. And this is one of the limitations that we have still now with diagnostic algorithm that we are using. Second limitation of fine needle aspiration, here is reported the number of false negative results at first try that are reduced at second try. Therefore, we have to ask us, do we have an accurate, sensitive, and specific single ultrasound features? The answer is not. How we try to deal and to overcome this limitation is to put together all the ultrasound features and create what are the so-called TIRADS. TIRADS is an acronym that stands for Tired Imaging Reporting in Data Systems. The main aims are to detect suspicious nodules with higher accuracy, 
to detect benign nodules that do not need fine needle aspiration, even more periodectomy, and to create reproducible and standardized report. However, we did a survey in Italy, and unfortunately, the results were really not optimistic. Only 30% of radiologists used it at that time, in 2016, trials. Here, I represent to all of you all the different trials, but unfortunately, these trials are too, much, too many, and we may be astonished. However, as WUFUM experts, we suggested already in our previous guidelines to use the tires. But there are also experiences that show that tires is still characterized by high expert opinion variability. And how much is time consuming? I report to you some of the most used tires, the K tires, in which we use and we try to report the different suspicious features. And also, recently, together with my endocrinologist in my university, we did an important study evaluating and putting in comparison all the different tire systems. And we showed that the highest sensitive is the ACR. In the ACR, you have to evaluate composition, echogenicity, shape, margin, and the presence or the absence of echogenic foci, discriminating micro, micro classification, or colloid. Then you add all the different points and you provide a tires classification. And according to it, and according to the size of the nodule, decide if the patient should be submitted to fine needle aspiration or to be followed. Recently, we were one of the first group to test the new artificial intelligence software dedicated for tired and breast. And uh, you can manually report the border of the lesion or automatically or semi-automatically the equipment provides for you then you can have also the depth, the width, the height, and the area, and all the composition. You have to add some information, such as calcification, elasticity, and central vascularity, and the software provides to you a possible categorization of that nodule. And we did publish our preliminary experience in June of Then we, I decided together with other colleagues to put together all the societies in Italy, the endocrinological one, the ultrasound, and the radiological one. And we provided another possible classification of the nodule, including also elastography that has high specificity. Why we wanted to include elastography? Since ancient Egypt times, we were aware that tissue stiffness is one of a possible worrisome sign in a body nodule. And Hippocrates included palpation as an essential part of physical examination, but we all of us know how limited is digital palpation. Recently, thanking technology, elasticity imaging is now a reality and is based on tissue stiffness or deformability evaluation rather than anatomy, giving us the possibility to quantify how much is stiff objectively that lesion. There are two types of elastography. One is strain, the second one is shear. The first one is applying displacement compression by compression by probe or using patient source such as carotid pulsation, and it provides qualitative or semi-quantitative information. The second one is a dynamic electric shear wave elastography. You apply a pulse, pulse it results in shear wave propagation that can be measured as a velocity or elasticity, providing to you quantitative evaluation. 
then we need to prove what we say, what we do. And the best way is using EBM-based guidelines. And uh, I'm honored to present to you the FSUM guidelines. The last version updated is available online on our website and also through our journal, our ultrasound journal, European journal of ultrasound, or also the Bufum guidelines. I was honored to be part of both the groups, especially for tyrants. Here, I represent to you how you do the compression and obtain the strain elastography. Or you just press a button and then obtain the shear wave elastography. The main relation is between strain and hardness. And this is represented by the fact that soft tissue has high deformability. Hard tissue has low deformability. And as a result, it will be reported in different colors. And uh, I want you to be very aware that red or blue can be changed. But what is important is to evaluate in your scale to which it corresponds. In this case, red is soft, blue is hard. But you can change it according to your preference. In the real time, it is very important to use the quality control that helps you to obtain real-time examination. You have a polychromatic box, you have this scale, then you have a quality indicator, and then you obtain the right percentage of compression. At the end, we have a classification that is based on the polychromatic representation that corresponds to the formability of the tire nodule, and then you have different score. This one is clearly a soft lesion, so score one. The second one has a softness with some parts that are stiff, lesser than 25%. Then 3A starts to become very complicated to be discriminated from 3B because this is very subjective. And we arrive to the lesion when it is completely stiff. It is very clear that this is a malignant. To avoid and to overcome this subjectivity, we included the possibility to have strain ratio evaluation with two ROIs, one within the model, another one nearby the tired gland. And we were one of the first group to show that what is important is the cutoff. But again, be aware, any kind of different equipment has a different cutoff. However, at the end, you put the ROI and you obtain a number. And according to the number, if you have done properly your examination, you achieve very good results. This is a typical example of a markedly hyperechoic lesion with fairly margina marginated uh, borders. After elastography, it appears very stiff, both at qualitative and semi-quantitative. And then there is an increase in size. Be aware. We have another sign that can be related with the, the progression of the disease. If there is an increase in size, this is related with the possible aggressiveness of the lesion. This is mostly reported for breast, but can be applied also for thyroid. Other software. This one uses the pulsation, carotid pulsation. Then you put your polychromatic box, you have only one ROI, and then at the end, the number. And we prove it. That is, it is also this software reliable enough. In literature, most of the papers suggest that it is effective. However, we showed also what are limitations. Firstly, it is dependent on carotid passive. Secondly, it is dependent on operator technique and training, and then patient dependent. Share with. You put the stone through the lake and you obtain some waves. These are the three different shares that we have right now. The point share, the 2D share, the 3D share. Let's see an example. I put one ROI, this is point share, and I have a velocity representation. In this case, we have the 2D share with polychromatic representation, different map, 
quality control, and then numbers expressed in meter per second and kilopascal. According to the first guidelines, we suggested to use elastography as an additional tool for differentiation of tire nodules. However, according to Wolfram guidelines, we also reported that we have too many cutoff values, especially for sharing, and that we have to take in account that not all the malignant nodules are stiff. Let's see what we usually do. So we evaluate the nodule, we evaluate the characteristics of ultrasound, we put a color doppler with different softwares which provide to you the 3D evaluation, and then elastography that shows that this is a very stiff lesion, put to Roy again confirming that this is a stiff lesion, Sherwell is confirming again that this is a stiff lesion, and that with the 3D Sherwell, I can also show how the border are really ill-marginated. Another case, soft lesion in 3D representation. Now, what is the best technique? We have evidence, right now published some papers, especially from our group, that strain ratio evaluation still is more accurate than share wave for tire. Meta-analysis confirmed what I already told you. And also, this is the real, very recent meta-analysis that is showing that ultrasound elastography, by means of strain elastography, is more effective than share wave. Very well marginated, polylobated nodule, markedly hyperchoid, with some microclassification. With the regular vascularization, prefer chaotic vascularization at 3D SMI, very stiff, confirmed at strain, confirmed at share wave. This was a papillary carcinoma. All the other guidelines are confirming that there is evidence to use elastography as an additional part of our workup for carotid character for tired characterization. However, you need to be adequately trained to use suitable parameters to avoid pre-compression vertical artifacts, check row size and position, and to use adequate equipment and to follow the right indication. What about CUS? CUS is an acronym that stands for contrast enhanced ultrasound. After the injection of less than two milliliters of a second generation contrast agent, you may achieve visual, subjective, qualitative parameters or quantitative parameters. However, in literature, most of the papers, especially from Western countries, are confirming that astrography is quite more accurate than CUS. Therefore, variable data and the necessity to have a standardization provide to us the not possibility to recommend CUS for daily life, but for research, for sure. Here is a typical example of benign lesion. However, it was indeterminate of fine needle aspiration, but the CUS shows how nicely and really resembling way is enhancing the module and is enhancing the tired prime candidate. But if you want to be more objective, you can use some polychromatic software or you can put to ROI and you can have the representation of a time intensity car. This other case, mostly characterized by microclassification, does not show any enhancement during the whole examination. And this was a marine case. Meanwhile, with recent software, you can really achieve very nice, useful, time intensity curve evaluation. We did publish recently with Maya and other authors a very nice review on the use of CUS. And we found that uh, the accuracy is around 80-85%. In general, for elastography, is around 90% but it is really useful for the evaluation of, thi of thyroid lymph node related metastasis and even 
for guiding and follow-up of mini-invasive treatment. In conclusion, the evaluation of Italian nodules should be using trials. We need to standardize. However, still, we don't have only one trials as in bias ones. The new system, artificial intelligence, may be very useful in order to help us to reduce the time consumed and secondly, to increase our accuracy. Literature and our personal experience shows that multi-parametric ultrasound, especially by means of ultrasound elastography, may be very useful to reduce the number of fine needle aspiration, reserving to CUS the evaluation of tire nodule treatment. New task force are coming up to try to obtain better results and to provide to you the standardization. By means of this rainbow sign, in this follicular lesion with different layers of color that resemble to me and remind to me the nice rainbow after the rain that he is really giving this light that is very nice to my colosseum, thanking the Hulme group that is really very effective and very dynamic in helping me with my presentation. I send to you my warmest regards. Ciao, arrivederci. I hope to see you soon around most probably in Eurozone, and to, to have you here in my place. Thank you very much, Vito Kanzitani. That was uh, another, an additional lecture about the importance of elastography and contrast media ultrasound, the additional tools. When he started, I thought he will speak a little bit more about the color Doppler. In the first slide, he integrated the color Doppler with different patterns, but in the thyroid system, it's uh, not integrated. That was all a discussion already. Please, uh, we look in the, are there some questions? Please look there. No actual one. No, then we, we are a little bit forward without in our time. That's why we want to use the last 15 minutes to test what you can take home of, from the lectures of Maya and Vito and the young lady who presented her paper. And so please scan now with your iPhone, I will do it too, excuse. Professor Nuremberg, there's the repeated question where you can find the recording of the meeting. Ah, yeah. No, it's not running. Oh, it's opened. For me, it's okay. I think we can start. We could start now. David, your microphone is closed. Who will start? Okay. Yeah, I will. I'm going to. How many participants we have in the Mentimeter? Five right now. Is it okay? We need some more. Why not more? We have, that means we have only four. Is that right? Hmm. David, can you go to start again? And we go back and explain again that there are other people we have to show that them that they use their scanner in the iPhone to go on the barcode. Exactly. The and you also have the link uh, in the chat directly there. You can go on menti.com 
Yeah, and we have you... we have 38 members in the session, but we need some more participants for the Mentimeter, yes? Yeah, so look at what mine is showing. Oh, exactly, okay. that's right. That's perfect. No. Okay, so welcome to our uh, students quiz uh, today. And the first one is um, also that we want to know where you're from. And uh, you can also look on your screen on your phone or directly on your laptop and uh, pin on the image where you're from. So we have a, an overlook from where the most people are today. So I think we have some from Brazil. That are only three. Now we have four, yes, five. That's not much. I think uh, some of the participants were uh, displaying that they are required to enter some extra passcode or something that they could not get through to the Mentimeter. Yeah, look at, uh, actually my code is, they are saying that it's not found. Something That's like... not found. Then go on the scan, on the barcode scanner. Have you the barcode scanner? That's very easy. I use barcode scanner. Have you that? No. I don't have that. no. Then explain again with the number, go back. We have, uh, that is not enough. We have only six participants now. They didn't. So this one is uh, the correct uh, number. You can uh, join it directly via this one. I shared this in the chat. Six, zero, three, five, six, five, seven. So seven digits. Okay, we have, now we can't wait longer we want to go on. Okay, perfect. So we have the first image here. It's a basic part. Uh, you see the ultrasound picture here, a small scan. And after it, we have a small question about it. So look also at the structures here, maybe which side it uh, can be and the other structures to get the most points. Okay, so we have our first question. So which thyroid lobe is visualized in this video? Is it the right thyroid <coughs> lobe, the left one, or is it the isthmus? All six were totally right. It's the left thyroid lobe. We have also the picture here again. And you see here on the left side, the left thyroid lobe directly in the middle of the trachea and more on the left side of the vessels um, direct, um, directly to the thyroid lobe. Okay, that's perfect. So this is the second one. And here the focus is more on the structures directly next to the theory. So also more in the lateral part of it. And this is our second question about it. 
And what is the anechoic structure at the lateral border of the tubular gland? Is it the esophagus? Is it the trachea, the carotid artery, or is it the jugular vein? Which one is the direct part left to the theory globe? Yeah, so six were also right. <coughs> And you see it directly on the left side of the uh, tuberate lobe. You have the artery here. And a little bit more on the left, you see the jugular vein of the picture. Okay, so we have our third picture here. And we see something directly in the steroid. So have a look on the structure and maybe also on the margin. So it looks a little bit different to the other ones we saw. And we also have a question for it. So how would you characterize the structure in this period gland? Is it solid? Is it a cystic one? Or would you say, is it also a normal gland um, on the ultrasound picture here? Yeah, totally right. It's a solid structure directly in the period lobe here. We will also have the, the picture here. So you see directly in the middle, solid um, structures directly in the left lobe. And here you see at the end also the arteries directly to it. Okay, fast. On the first leaderboard, Venture and Carl Gustav place one and two. Let's have another three questions and see who's going to win this Mentimeter round. Okay. Again, look at the different structures. Okay, I'm going to proceed with the question. Fourth question is, where was the question? Was I too fast? So, okay. How would you characterize the structure in this thyroid gland? Is it solid, cystic or normal? Most of the participants are right. It's cystic, Professor Member, do you want to comment or should we proceed? You can go proceed. You can yeah, see okay. it's an echo free lesion in the middle in the east isthmus region and it's free of echoes. So it's cystic. Fifth question, five of, of six. And the next question. Now we have 10 participants. How would you rate margins of the nodule? Is it smooth, irregular, or lobulated?
Uh, smooth and regulated. Smooth is the right answer. Let's have a look again. And because of time, I'm proceeding to the last question. Let's see who's going to win this round, our last video for today. And our final question for this picture. Which malignant nodal sign do you recognize? Is it irregular contour, microcalcification, hypoorganic T, or all? A little bit divided <laughs> the field, please, Professor Nuremberg, or... Um, I will comment very yeah. briefly. There you can see everything. The contours are irregular. They are microcalcification, and it is clearly hypoechoic. And this is uh, how systematic we should look at the nodules, not to miss any of those patterns, because every one of them makes a difference. Okay, let's have a look who is the winner of this Mentimeter round. Yeah, and Carl Gustav were... Ah. Let's see. And the first three stayed the same. Aya is the winner this time. Congratulations. Okay, open your screens. Who is Aya? Please. Show us your picture, show us your screen. Where's Aya? I can't see you. Ah, there's Aya. From where you come? From Turkey. From Turkey. Congratulations. And thank you for taking part in our Mentimeter. Thank you, Maya, for the nice videos you sent us. And thank you to Niels and to David. That was a long afternoon about the topic of thyroid. We heard a lot about the nodules and the systematic of the nodules and also the tools we can use as a multi-parametric ultrasound in the future uh, to integrate the elastography and also to integrate contrast media ultrasound. Thank you very much for taking part in our meeting. Uh, one of you asked me where you can find uh, the recorded lecture. You can find it in next week on the website of WIFM. Go to WIFM website, to the webinars, and there you can find the recorded lecture and can see something again. We will see you again at the 4th June. That is also a Saturday because the participants is better at Saturday afternoon. See you again at the beginning of June, Saturday, the 4th June. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your nice lecture the, to the ladies from Latvia and to the students from Germany.